So if we plot on this uh, uh, relatively simple graph roughly the number of Ebola virus particles uh, in a patient uh, upon initial exposure. So this is day one when somebody's been exposed to the Ebola virus. What happens is the virus goes through a period of incubation whereby it's starting to replicate in an individual uh, yet the individual is having no symptoms. And that period, we always hear the 21 day period, but most people exposed to Ebola virus uh, infection are become infected within one to two weeks. So I'm going to put that seven to 14 day period down. Over here is, which is the time when you're gonna start to see uh, fever. And sometimes what are referred to as flu-like uh, symptoms. So what's happening here is the amount of virus in the body at this time is actually quite low. And therefore the risk of trans transmitting the virus to another individual is also low and that's why you're not going to get Ebola virus sitting on an airplane or being on a cruise ship uh, and that's why also in Dallas it was a relatively straightforward matter when Mr. Uh, Duncan uh, uh, became ill uh, we were able to uh, identify all of his contacts and isolate them and that is why no Ebola outbreak happened in uh, Dallas. So typically what happens around this period is that we start producing uh, this protein called interferon that I'll abbreviate as IFN and it is one of the most potent uh, factors in our bodies that uh, can be used to combat virus infections but what the Ebola virus does is it has the unique ability to shut it down and the way it shuts it down is quite ingenious so one of the proteins that it uses uh, has the ability to bind double-stranded RNA. Well, why is that important? Well, when, a, when a, an Ebola virus uh, replicates, Ebola virus is an RNA virus, what's called a plus-stranded, I mean, it's, it's a plus-stranded RNA virus that has, that uses an RNA polymerase to replicate and it produces double-stranded RNA temporarily. Now, why is that important? Well, the only time the human body ever sees double-stranded RNA, practically speaking, is when it, it, when it sees a virus. So double-stranded RNA is the hallmark feature of many virus infections, including Ebola virus. This is a trigger to the body to start producing interferon. What the Ebola virus does, however, is it produces a protein that binds up double-stranded RNA and basically masks it from the host, meaning us, ever recognizing it. So essentially, our interferon response is tamped down, is, is blocked, is, is reduced. And then what happens is the Ebola virus has the ability to replicate, and it replicates massively. So over the next few days, so by day, say, 10 to 17 after infection, we have a massive amount of Ebola virus particles in our organs, in our liver, in our, in our spleen, uh, in our kidneys, in our lungs. And the reason why a patient with Ebola gets so sick and ultimately will die 70% of the time because it has a 70% mortality is because of massive, massive numbers of viral particles actually destroying our target organs. Uh, some people use the term liquefying our target organs. The people at risk then, therefore, are people taking care of Ebola virus patients in this orange zone. This becomes the critical period uh, when it's very difficult to care for uh, an Ebola patient because the, the patient has so much virus in his body and getting virus on his skin. I mean, and in my opinion, in the United States, we should only be taking care of patients like this uh, who are in the advanced stages of their disease uh, in specialized biocontainment facilities. I do not think we should have uh, patients like this in regular acute care hospitals because they don't have the adequate biocontainment and, they're not tr and we're, we're not training uh, nurses and other healthcare providers daily uh, on how to use this personal protective uh, equipment. So what are, the, what are the options that we have to intervene? Well, one of them is to give uh, Ebola antibodies. 
and Ebola antibodies are typically obtained from the blood of an individual who is, was infected with Ebola virus and then subsequently uh, was, able, was able to recover. Uh, another opportunity for, to intervene is to use uh, antiviral drugs. So these are drugs that inhibit the ability of the RNA virus, Ebola virus, to replicate by inhibiting this enzyme called RNA polymerase. So it's actually preventing uh, virus replication. Again, these are drugs that, in my opinion, have to give, be given very early on in the course of the epidemic. Uh, there's also a, a monoclonal antibody that's produced in plants known as uh, ZMAP, and that yet yeah, represents yet another uh, potential uh, strategy. You've been hearing a lot about vaccines. There are several promising vaccines out there. The question is how quickly can they be delivered? So in addition to presenting Ebola virus uh, antigens to the body like the GSK vaccine, I'm wondering whether the VSV vaccine might be particularly exciting because it is a, it's a live virus that's inducing lots of interferon. So one question that I have uh, is whether this new link genetics VSV vaccine could induce interferon in an Ebola virus patient uh, and be delivered therapeutically. Could it overcome the interferon block? It's a theoretical idea, but one that's potentially exciting.